A recent report by the oil and gas industry suggests that they will release 120 billion tons of carbon pollution into the air, but you won't read that in the newspaper. Today on Roundtable Perspective, Dr. Stephen Maycheck joins me in discussing media censorship and media filtering and why the public doesn't always get the information that we need about the world in which we live. Welcome to the Roundtable Perspective. I'm your host, Lee Arts. I'm joined today by my guest, Dr. Steve Maychik from Naperville, the uh, North Central College. And we're going to talk today about censorship and media framing. Welcome, Dr. Well, Maychik. Thanks so much for having me, Lee. It's a pleasure to be back at the Roundtable. Yes. I've spoken here before, so it's great to, great to be back. Well, if our viewers don't remember, Dr. Maychik is a professor of communication, as I said, at North Central. He teaches and does research in media studies, urban studies, and um, other things. I know that we, we know of your uh, public museum exhibit that talked about film censorship, uh, eight decades of film censorship in Chicago, and I know you're working on a book um, yes. uh, on that title. Um, you're also a juror for uh, Project Censored which we wanted to talk a bit about today. Project Censored is a um, 40-year anniversary now, started at Sonoma State University, but it's grown way beyond that. So every year they release 25 stories that they say jurors look at, and you've been a juror, that are the most uh, censored I'm, stories. I'm not a juror. I'm a faculty, I'm a faculty evaluator. I'm also... Um, before I'm, you get to the juror. <laughs> I'm, before I get to the juror. And I'm also... Um, the editor of the Media Democracy in Action chapter for this year's book. Yes, excellent. Starting next year, I will be editing the top 25 okay. uh, chapter, so the central chapter of the book with the, on, on the top 25 stories. Well, these are remarkable. I mean, the fact that they're censored means people probably don't know what they don't <laughs> know, <laughs> to coin an old phrase. But th there were several that hit me. One, Facebook partnering with the National Endowment for Democracy, the oil and gas companies, uh, have, have said that they will release 120 billion tons of carbon emission in the next 10 years. Uh, the FBI surveillance of climate change protesters, Google surveillance for a number of uh, governments, um, and there's many, many more. So maybe, maybe out of the 25, you could talk about one that really struck let you. Me talk about a, let me just talk about uh, two really quickly. Um, uh, you mentioned the number two story, which is, um, uh, face, Facebook, Facebook partnering with, um, it's a story about uh, think tank partnerships establish Facebook as a tool of U.S. foreign policy. And it's about Facebook in response to criticisms that it had been used, right, as a tool of right. the Russians Russian hacking, to yeah. influence um, the 2016 election and in response to criticisms about the fact that you know there's so much fake news and propaganda circulating on the platform um, has decided you know as a response to fake to fake news and to and to the circulation of propaganda to partner up with first of all the Atlantic Council uh, which is a think tank that is funded by the US State Department Yes. by the Army, <laughs> the Navy, and the Air Force that has on its board uh, former generals, former, C former CIA directors, and, and former very hawkish uh, secretaries of state like um, Henry Kissinger so Facebook. and Condoleezza Rice. And they're going to get advice from the Atlantic Council about how to eliminate propaganda from So from, Facebook will uh, be taking taking advice from these government agencies or from former government former directors. Former US government that and will tell US Facebook what is factual or what should be precisely considered propaganda. How, how how to how to eliminate fake news uh, from the from from the platform and, and that's from the not feed. censorship and that apparently is not censorship okay. even though these are th these are people who and you know, the Atlantic Council is intimately connected right with um, the national security apparatus. And shortly after they made this announcement, right, that they were partnering <laughs> uh, with um, the Atlantic Council, which is a very you know, kind of hawkish and, and right-leaning uh, yeah. you know, national security think tank, um, Facebook uh, started taking down 
um, pages for um, uh, for for pa pa pages associated with Venezuela. For example, they took down Telazur English, which is the English language page of the news service that is sponsored, among other things, by the Venezuelan government. Yeah. Um, they took down the page for Venezuela analysis, which provides independent analysis of of news about Venezuela and especially about you know the kind of um, you know the, the the sort of crisis that's going on down there um, and. You know, in response to protests, they put those pages back up. But they, you know, shortly after they made this announcement, they took down the took down those pages. They also changed their algorithms well, that, so that, that so that um, so that. Uh, progressive news sites like Common Dreams were de-emphasized um, and had less traffic, um, and so that doesn't seem like a coincidence to us. And um, and you know the major corporate news media did not really report on this partnership that Facebook had established so, uh, with with the Atlantic Council. Normally, when we think about censorship, we think of like. Egypt jailing right. 30 journalists sure. Or, sure. or Turkey saying you can't print this. Right. But w when we are saying that Facebook, which is not a government right. agency, makes the decisions over what will be on Facebook, which is not a news site anyway, anyway right. how, ca how can that rise to the level of censorship? Or you're not saying that, you're saying that or Project Censor is saying it's the fact that the media did not report this, this story. It's the fact that the media did not report, or did not report adequately, the fact that Facebook was now going to be taking advice on how to curate news on its and platform they actually instituted from, algorithms. from a, a, right. you know, a U.S. government-backed um, and very right, very right-wing, very militaristic think tank. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I think the other story that's in the top 25 that I really like, because I think it's a clear-cut example of censorship, um, is story number 19. Um, and let me, just, uh, let me just mention it, uh, read, the, read the title of, uh, of, the of the story. It's Censorship of Al Jazeera Documentary Exposes Influence of Pro-Israel Lobby. It's a fascinating story. Uh, that was researched by a student at Drew University out, uh, out on the East Coast, um, uh, and the faculty evaluator was Lisa Lynch, who I think is in the Journalism and Media Studies department there. So um, Al, Jaz Al Jazeera, uh, which as you know, is, is backed by the, um, the Qatari government yeah. um, and is funded by Qatari government funds, is nevertheless one of the great kind of news outlets in the Middle East providing independent news um, about mi Middle East affairs. Um, one of the reporters went undercover as an intern at the Israel Project, which is a pro-Israeli organization in Washington, D.C., in order to research and document um, uh, what um, an electronic intifada uh, article summarized as the efforts of Israel and its lobbyists to smy spy on, smear, and intimidate U.S. citizens who support Palestinian human rights, especially the BDS movement. Um, and Bo especially. Bo boycott, divest, and sanction. Bo bo right, di boycott, right. divest, and sanction. Um, so. <laughs> um, he goes undercover and um, you know gets this really explosive footage of you know leaders of pro-Israeli lobbying groups uh, talking about uh, uh, websites like Canary Mission, which target um, uh, you know faculty and students who are critical of Israel or support the boy the boycott, um, the divestment and sanctions movement. Um, you know, for, for trolling and, and for, you know, for, for you know, these kind of anonymous online attacks. And he points to this as an exemplary, as an exemplary model of what, um, of what you know, pro-Israeli lobbying groups should be doing. Um, so <laughs> the, the censorship is that Qatar, um, in response to pressure from the Israeli government or from someone, we, we're not sure, it could be just lobbying groups sympathetic to Israel, withdrew um, the, and did not release the documentary um, for national security reasons. But it was then leaked to a number of news sites who, who, um, who released clips from the documentary. Um, but the documentary itself still has so not the documentary been, has never been released. Never been released. It was and an the, Al Jazeera project. It was but an then Al, Jazeera, Al Jazeera canceled the project. Al Jazeera canned it. And the background to this is is I think really important, which is that um, 
This is at a moment when Saudi Arabia um, is, you know, has, has cut off relations with Qatar. They're being increasingly isolated in the Middle East. Um, and so they're turning to Israel <laughs> and trying to ingratiate themselves to Israel. And one way that they, they've done this, it apparently, um, is by suppressing this documentary. Uh, again, again, like the Facebook story, th this seems to go outside the bounds of what we what we normally think of media censorship. Again, because it's like, in the case of Saudi right. Arabia, their censorship is they arrest right. journalists, they sure. kill journalists, they sure. assassinated Khashoggi and others. Right. But this is not the government saying, although I understand Qatar owns Al Jazeera or right. funds so it. They're, they're, it's, but it's Al Jazeera. It's a closer to classic, to classic yeah. censorship. But yes, it is still Even so, it's Al Jazeera yeah. made this decision. They Presumably right. an editor could say we decided it wasn't newsworthy. Facebook is not a government agency. Right. It's a private institution. Right. So that's, that's part of what um, strikes me about many of the stories in here is that these are not censored by a media censor that says you can't print this. Absolutely National not. security, we don't like it. It's not censored by a dictator. Right. I this mean, so censorship here is understood a little bit differently. Right, okay, so uh, let, me, let me back up and say that, you know, I think classically here in the United States, especially under, um, uh, under First Amendment law, um, right, uh, censorship is understood as government prior restraint. Right over the media, over the press. You can't print this, the you can't The government attempting to prevent the release of information, yep. attempting to prevent the publication of articles, um, the broadcasting of news, And there have been instances of that. And there have been plenty of instances. Yep. So the classic example that many in your audience might be aware of is what, hap is what happened around the Pentagon Papers case. When Daniel Ellsberg, right, whistleblower, who leaked the Pentagon Papers, the secret history of the U.S. government's um, involvement in wars in South, South, Southeast Asia, right, to the New York Times. Um, and then the Nixon administration went um, and to a court and got an injunction to block the, the New York Times from printing any further stories based on this classified leaked yeah. document saying that this was going to endanger national security. Um, and that led to a Supreme Court case, right, the New York Times for, uh, versus U.S., where the, where the Supreme Court said, even though, <laughs> right, this document was illegally obtained, it's top secret, and Daniel Ellsberg broke the law by leaking it to the New York Times, you can't, um, it, it, you, you can't suppress it, um, and that it didn't really um, endanger um, it, it might have endangered the national interest, it might have embarrassed the U.S. government, but it didn't endanger any American troops or any uh, Amer American civilians, and therefore, um, you know, it could, it, it could be published. That's the, that's the sort of classic definition of censorship, is when the government tries to prevent a media outlet from publishing something. And there have been plenty of cases, I think, of that, and there are still cases of that, and we highlight some of them um, in the book, and I, I want to come back to I want to come back to that. But um, what we're talking about here is really censorship by private entities, private companies, um, in most cases by the corporate media, who um, are suppressing information for a variety of reasons. So um, many of the members of your audience have probably heard from you before about um, Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman's famous propaganda model yes. <laughs> of, the, of the capitalist media, um, right? Where they suggest that um, the kind of news that we receive from you know, CNN, um, the Washington Post, the New York Times. Or the Hammond uh, Times or the, the Chicago and, and Tribune. And the Hammond Times, yeah. definitely from the Chicago Tribune, right? Um, uh, um, are filtered by these institutional constraints, right, that limit what, um, what kind of news is gonna get reported. The first one is the fact that these companies are by and large owned by large multinational corporations with boards of trustees that include representatives of 
Fortune 500 companies yes. involved in all sorts of other um, all sorts of other businesses. They're a profit making. They're profit making ventures. They're they're not in this for charity. They're doing this to well, make they, money. Some might even argue they're not there for to serve the public they're, interest or to provide public information. It's to sell a paper. They're selling or, papers yeah. and they're attracting an audience to sell to advertisers. The other and the second constraint that Chomsky and Herman identify is the advertisers. Right. All of the commercial media and even really um, you know, public uh, radio, public television as we know it here in the United States depend on either directly on advertisers or in the case of public, uh, you know, PBS and NPR on corporate underwriters, right, sponsors who, um, who support, uh, who support the, the, the news operation. Um, and then, you know, a, a third filter is, f is. Well, don't uh, go away oh, from the advertising. Okay, sure, because, sure. Because, <laughs> Because uh, if I'm running this newspaper for a business and I'm getting money from sales, but I'm also getting a large money right. from advertisers, I'm less likely to run an expose uh, on uh, auto repair uh, if half of the paper is advertisements for auto sales. There's a N and nobody has to tell me, but right. I'm just going to do it out of the pure. So it's not like a, a secret, right. but it's, right. it's, it's part of a business model. It's part of the business model. And they, they want to publish news that creates a, 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 a good environment for, for, for advertising. So okay. downbeat news about, for example, poverty, extreme poverty, um, extreme inequality is not the kind of um, news well, that's that's likely to put people in a buying mood, um, and so it's not going to be supported. But it's not going to be supported by advertisers. Spectacle and crisis is okay. Yeah. Well, mo moving on. Moving on. So the the third filter, um, right, is sourcing. Um, and especially when it comes to national news, and especially when it comes to foreign policy news, and a lot of the stories that, um, that make it onto the top 25 list every year have to do with foreign policy. Um, uh, uh, journalists are very, very dependent on official sources, um, either um, official government sources or highly placed um, private sources, you know, corporate also, sources. Also and because sources. those corporations are profit-making institutions and aren't going to pay an investigative reporter to spend yeah, yeah. two months like the one Absolutely. guy did from Al Jazeera to do a documentary, Absolutely. I want news tomorrow. Right. And who better to get the news from than the people that know but it, which exactly. is other they, sources. They, 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 yeah. they sort of spoon-feed information. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, journalists are only, I mean, in general, journalists are only as good as their sources. They yeah. are dependent uh, in a certain way on their sources. But um, the kind of corporate uh, journalism that we see being practiced by, you know, CNN and the big television news networks especially is highly dependent, right, on being in the good graces of who's ever in the White oh, House. Oh, yeah, we've had the example of the White House right. saying you can't come back and right. then suddenly you're not a reporter because you, you, right. you can't get the quote that you need. Exactly. So you don't or, want to, uh, or, you know, you're allowed to be at the press conference, but, but nobody will, you, will, will you, allow you to ask a question. question. <laughs> so you're basically worthless to the news organization as a journalist, so that's a way of filtering the news because you can't ask a question if you don't write the right the right story, Absolutely. and that's a filter. Absolutely, that's okay. a filter, and then um, flack or um, negative feedback um, that's usually organized by powerful interests to pressure. Um, put pressure on yeah. news organizations is another fil filter. And um, that's, I think, very important in explaining why our news media cover, for example, the defense industry that the way that they do. Because the Pentagon has an enormous budget uh, mm -hmm. for public relations, right? Um, they, spend lot, they spend lots and lots of money on, on, on people for, you know, on, on, on an, an attempt to shape the message about um, the defense industry about the military yes, and, and about a, U.S. foreign and, and policy. And to report on U.S. actions in 147 different countries, right. you are open to the charge of being unpatriotic or not supportive right. of uh, American values. Right. And again, that's a very difficult hurdle to get over, so you're more likely not to go there you're, at all. You're more likely not to go there. A good example is the Chicago Tribune back in the 80s had a reporter who was a, like a, he himself was a veteran, um, but he insisted um, in an annoying way on um, pointing out all of the graft inefficiency and waste at the Pentagon uh, yeah. and asking all sorts of questions about the billions upon billions of dollars that was that were, were being spent on weapons programs where you know you know 
there are examples of planes that didn't yeah, that couldn't yeah. fly and and you know missile systems that or never that never, toilet seats. never yeah, worked right. or right the twenty five hundred dollar hammer hammers the right, five right. fifteen thousand dollar toilet seats um, and because of that right um, the Pentagon started putting pressure on the Chicago Tribune to silence this guy. Yeah. or to rein him in, and, and, and eventually he was fired yeah. um, because he was doing his job too well. Yeah. Um, so, and okay. then the final filter that you know, Chomsky and Herman identify is ideology, um, the dominant ideology. They used to call it anti-communism because during the Cold War right. that certainly was the dominant ideology here in the United States. Now they simply call it sort of the, the you know, pro-capitalist or you know, pro-free market. Free market. Yeah. Um, kind of neoliberal, what we might today call a neoliberal so ideology. These, the, so these filters, right. the ownership of the media, advertising sources, uh, an ideology that I would argue journalists also internalize, learned, internalize yeah. because yeah. you get your job and that's who's paying your paycheck. Sure. Are, are you suggesting that those things filter become a form of censorship, not because there's some right. invisible hand or even clear hand doing it, but because it's the the business model right. of how information. I think, it, I think it works even without there being sort of clear direction from, I mean, I think there are cases where there's clear direction from above, right. from people in power, whether those are. But that can't happen on a daily that basis. That doesn't happen on a daily basis, right. So whether that's, you know, executives or people, you know, shareholders or so forth, there are cases where there's clear direction. Um, but in most cases, right, it happens without anybody, right, actually steering the ship and succeeds in producing a kind of censored, you know, news, news media. Now, that doesn't mean that these stories never get mentioned. And one of the things that... Well, you know, they must have because otherwise they, you wouldn't know they, that they They were. absolutely have. They absolutely <laughs> you have. You have to find it somewhere. And so when, when Project Censor talks about censorship, what we really mean is underreported, uh -huh. right? Stories that did not receive the attention that they would have merited, right? Because they're so explosive, right? Stories like, um, you know, you mentioned- Well, the story, the, uh, 120 billion tons of carbon, carbon emission in the next going to 10 be years in the middle of climate change. Dumped and into the, right. Flooding of Venice, it's like- Right. But, but you could see where a journalist or a newspaper would say, well, that's not news because everybody knows we have right. polluted air. <laughs> right. So why do we right. have to right. bring people down besides their right. uh, buying full page ads by mobile, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think that that many of those. I think if if you want an explanation for why many of these stories did not get more coverage, and in many in many cases they got occasional mentions in the corporate media, and we like to we like to say corporate media and independent media rather okay. than mainstream media because even though they're the most highly funded media, <laughs> um, and maybe have the largest audiences, we don't think they represent the mainstream yes, of yes. American society. So we call it corporate media, and we believe um, that the corporate media occasionally will report on important stories, but so, they won't pursue them the way and in, in the depth that is required by, um, but by the you know the kind of intrinsic value and, and importance of the stories, and it's usually smaller. Um, you know, magazines, independent magazines and newspapers, like for example, in these times up in Chicago, who are the ones that are, um, you know, kind of reporting, digging in and reporting, um, you know, extensively on these stories. Well, we, we don't have a lot of time. I know. <laughs> we, we, I, I'd like to kind of end with this. Is so. We've got social media, we've got digital communication, obviously students, maybe students are the exception, we're able to find these stories. So why would we be concerned about this uh, media framing or the media filters that keep some of the information from, I mean, there's so many bad things. Why do we need to know more of the things <laughs> that the government or some corporation is up to? I mean, what does it do to democracy, I guess, is the, well, the big question. I think, I think this is the, the reason why we published this book and is that one of the past directors of Project Censored, Peter Phillips, once said, um, America has the best entertained and least informed uh, citizenry of any country in the world, right? Um, and it's because um, of something that's highlighted in one of the chapters that's included in every single one of the books, which is the junk food news chapter. <laughs> every year, right? So when, when Project Censored first started, right, trying to draw attention to underreported stories, Journalists 
and editors at mainstream corporate newspapers and news outlets would come, come back to Carl Jensen, the founder, and say, you know, um, that's, it's all very well and good. These are important stories. But we just don't have the time or the space yeah. to cover these stories. We're covering more important stories. That's why we're not covering these stories. So then he started to investigate what, in fact, they were covering. And when you look at what they do cover, they cover a lot of fluff and tripe. Yes, yes. So in this year's um, junk food news story, right, a junk food news chapter, um, it highlights the fact that like one of the top stories of the year was Meghan Merkel and, and Prince Harry's uh, royal baby, which, <laughs> which dominated headlines and dominated news cycles for several weeks. But at the same time, right, no attention was being given to the crisis, right, in, uh, um, among, uh, you know, in maternal health among African Americans right, right, right. and, 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 and Afri African American women and, and, and women well, of color. One of, the, one of yeah. the things that makes stories censored is they claim that they don't have time to do it. And right. unfortunately, we don't have time to finish this conversation, right. but we will, we will try to do it again. Uh, that's all the time we have for on our program. Thank you, Dr. Maycheck, for Thank you. joining me today on Roundtable Perspective. I'm Lee Arts. I'll see you next time.